technical issues, the internet is off. I think uh, we should continue with the next session, um, which is the session of use cases, hydrogen aviation use cases. And as first speaker, we have here um, Josef Kallo from DLR. A lot of everybody, I think, who think about aviation, flying and hydrogen over the last years has heard his name. So, uh, Josef, if you can give us an update, uh, you want to share your screen, I think. Um, it should be possible and you should unmute your phone, Xin, perhaps. You can. Uh, I, I'm the, sorry, uh, I'm the host now, so I have to hand over the host again. And perhaps all who are not presenters anymore, if they could switch off their um, cameras, because then uh, we will have a camera for Josef again. Um, and uh, I see Josef, uh, uh, have you unmuted? Um, uh, ah, this is the reason. Hello, uh, Josef. Uh, no, audio. I, ah, now, yes, now you I are. Think yes, now, now I'm I unmuted. Check. Okay. And I'll leave you the stage for you and I will uh, go off. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I have a short presentation. Willy, you have just to tell me how much time I have. So <clears throat> how many minutes, just roughly? Roughly, uh, I would say 15 minutes. We're good in time and it's always very interesting. We have. Uh, yeah, if you can talk about 15 okay. minutes and then we have a Q&A later as it works uh, in a breakout version. Okay. Okay, so emission-free flight with hydrogen. I will accelerate a little bit. So um, I am responsible. I'm responsible at the German Aerospace Center uh, for the Department of Energy Systems Integration at the Institute of Engineering Thermodynamics. And we deal there with uh, battery systems and fuel cell systems. Uh, and we are experts on hydrogen implementing uh, systems into aircraft application. We also have this H2Fly, which is hydrogen to fly startup out of the DLR, which owns the HY4 and also takes care about the overall uh, propulsion design, including the electric motor. The electric motor itself is developed together with our partners at the university where I am the director of the Institute of Energy Conversion and Storage. And there we do motors between 180, 190, 200 kilowatt and up to megawatt level. So with this together, I will focus today um, on the hydrogen fuel cell uh, propulsion system. So we have definitely the classic um, point with kerosene and gas turbine. Then we have the most improved with kerosene hydrocarbons as fuel, even with hydrogen as a fuel and gas turbines, and then an electric generator and hybridized by batteries with an electric motor. Today, I will focus on the hydrogen use in fuel cells together with a battery if needed to propel an electric motor to go flying. So why are we doing this? What we know is definitely that, uh, as an example, in Frankfurt, we have from all those 46 million passengers per year, not last year, but in 2019, um, we, we had almost 20 million passengers flying in from less than 800 kilometers. So in 2033, we will have expected 91 mega hubs uh, due to our colleagues from the German Aerospace Center with more, more than a half a billion of passengers which will fly in from less than 800 kilometers. So there is a huge CO2 saving if we can minimize uh, the emissions by flying with a fuel cell. Um, I will go into that 800 kilometers later. 
Also, if we can have a plane which can fly less than 2000 kilometers, we will skip more than 50% of the emissions. So what you see there, the thin curve is the, fly, the fuel per distance bin. So going there and integrating all those numbers until 2000 kilometers, we get much more than 50% in fuel uh, burn, which goes into emission. But to go into this, we cannot fly with four seater or 10 seater. Uh, we definitely have to go bigger. And we think that it's, cr it's crucial to go to bigger, let's say to 150 passengers. But from a realistic point of view today, we think that, uh, that a 40 seater is feasible. My colleagues from uh, Göttingen and Braunschweig calculated some ranges. And if we take the 328 with improved wings, we definitely have a chance to go roughly if we have a system energetic weight of 630 watt hours per kilogram, where every battery is far away from reaching that, we can go roughly 1000 kilometers at full payload, maybe 750. And what we expect to be realistic with liquid hydrogen and fuel cells, including the motor, is to achieve 1200 watt hours per kilogram, having a range of full payload of 1,500 with a little bit less payload at 2,000 kilometers. There is also another possibility to store hydrogen in liquid. Unfortunately, that is not certified and there was just one test specimen tested and there are some challenges with the boil off. But I would say from a realistic point of view, we should stay around 1,000 watt hours per kilogram in the next couple of years. Also, my colleagues have done a lot of development on the, um, on the conceptual side from classic applications with uh, twin engine to more sophisticated with twin engine and wingtip propeller with distributed propulsion. And what we have seen is, is when you take a 70 seater, uh, let's say baseline TPR 70, which we have today, turboprop 70, which we have today, by only improving with new engines, which are today, let's say the last uh, generation, we can save a lot of fuel on the fleet. Then putting some uh, hydrogen and also some hybrid planes with uh, wingtip propellers and improved aerodynamic efficiency, we can go maybe to 35 to 40%. And if we go to distributed propulsion, we can have a short takeoff, but we pay for that a penalty in efficiency. So we have to do a trade-off what our mission would be like. So what we think is, is that as a baseline, we have a chance to go into a 40-seater regional aircraft, around about two megawatt combined hybrid propulsion power, even a little bit more than that. And we need an approximately cruise of 1.3 megawatt. With that, we can go up to like 250 knots. And depending on the kind of fuel storage system which we implement, if we go with a 1,200 watt hours per kilogram, we could scratch the 2,000 kilometers in range by improving the 续航历程，而且过程当中，呃，前提是呢，它的。What kind of other applications? So I have done some uh, with my colleagues from H2 Fly. They started uh, thinking about how to put these applications into place, how to use fuel cell and hydrogen. And what we see is, is that going into like VTOL types air, airplanes, around about peak power 350 kilowatt, maybe cruise power at 200 kilowatt, we can reach a range of realistic 150 to 180 kilometers without reserve around 250 kilometers. That would be the maximum for today's perspective. Going into general aviation, taking a six seater, you definitely can go to like 1,500 kilometers we just um, finished the, 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 the work on the HY4, so on the hydrogen plane, which you see in my background. And uh, we, had, we will have um, a new press release on Friday on that and the presentation of the plane. But we can go with general aviation, I would say roughly 370 kilometers an hour up to like 1,500 kilometers. And on the 40 seater side, a new concept in parallel to what I developed together with the University of Stuttgart 
shows us that we need a peak power of three megawatt and then we will go with the cruise power around about 1,400 kilowatt and we can go 500 kilometers an hour a little bit more than that for more than a thousand nautical miles so this converged together and this would be i would say the realistic part for the next 10 years to go with hydrogen and fuel cell system Challenges with that are definitely the storage system, gravimetric energy density, which at the moment can be elaborated at realistic 28%. More than that, it's feasible, but the problem with that is, is that it's not from certifiable from today's perspective. So there, a lot of new work has to be done, engineering focused on um, certification and qualification. Also, due to the new arrangement of the systems, the center of gravity and the cooling system implementation has to be taken care of. And very important, the energy distribution system, which should have more than 1000 volt, optimally around for this power around 1500 volt, maybe a slightly little bit higher. What we have to take care about is the insulation. And we all know that the insulation and the breakthrough voltage and also the corrosion and the corona effects um, are taking uh, place when the geometrical shape of the conductors is not well uh, built. So in that case, we know also that the passion law, when we go to high altitudes, uh, can go to a breakthrough depending on the geometric shape of the conductors and depending also on the altitude and the pressure there of the air. And then we see that if we stay very low in in, in geometrical distance between the conductors. We even can have a breakthrough at 700 volt, maybe at 1,500 volt, depending on the geometric. If it's parallel, it's higher. If it's with edges, with sharp edges, is lower. So this is something which has to be implemented in the complete uh, architecture of the energy distribution system. Also, every component has to be taken care of, not only by having hydrogen, so high voltage, but also by having um, certifiable components, which means that we have to go into uh, a lot of work to make them uh, lightweight and certifiable. So with this redundant uh, hydrogen electric powertrain based on the ARP 4754 process, um, for the HY4, which uh, I can say officially will be disclosed on Friday, but we had a lot of very good testing in flight with this. We see the um, hydrogen system, which is uh, um, redundant. Then we see the fuel cell systems, which are redundant. And very important here, a lot of logic into the power module control devices, which are steered by a DAL A uh, controller. And then we have to go into redundant motors and the powertrain design not only the fuel cell design but also the overall powertrain design when we want to go to a 40 seater we have to really take care about all those points with the high voltages and the insulation and the geometrical shape so it's a challenge but from our perspective it's feasible so taking all those things with process with sensors certified qualifi qualified components going into certification and qualification. We ha have also to take care about the operations. So if hydrogen spilling is there, what will happen with that hydrogen and so on. So what we need is a worldwide qualification base to qualify the concepts, the modules, the powertrains, and at the end, the play. So what is the gain from that? What you see here is, is um, um, so the, the, the sensitivity of the perception of the human ear. And what we see here on the x-axis is that at one kilohertz, between 500 and one kilohertz, we have a very high sensitivity of the human ear. There, the turbines do a lot of work. Then if we go down to, let's say, uh, some engines with uh, with combustion engines, we definitely can go down to something like maybe 50 hertz, maybe in the region of 100 hertz. But if we have a chance to go with the fuel cell plane, even to 
due to the high torque of the electric motor and the propeller, which is not a high speed propeller, but can be very slow turning, then we have a chance to go to lower frequencies and that can be a high gain on that. So the next gain could be to go with uh, renewable energies to produce the hydrogen and then based on that to fly around. Just to give you the numbers, in Germany, we had used kerosene worth 105 terawatt hours. And to compare that with the surplus of energy, which we expect from renewables installed in 2018, we know that the perspective for 2030 is to have something like 35 terawatt hours per year. And comparing that with 105, which we are using today, and definitely this is also for long range, for short range and so on. But just to give you a comparison, this including 100% conversion efficiency, which would not be realistic. Conversion efficiency from electricity to hydrogen is roughly 65% in a very good electrolyzer we definitely have to install a, not a lot of new renewable energy, um, solar and wind to produce the fuel which we need for flying around electrically with hydrogen. I'm very confident on this because I have seen that wind in the US became very, very cheap to be produced on ground. So we are talking about $32 per megawatt hours even in best places around less than 2.5 cent per kilowatt hour or 25 um, dollars per megawatt hour. And if we calculate that in fuel, including the, the, the price of, um, of the investment, we see that we could fly with a renewable hydrogen at around about three euros per 100 kilometer per passenger if we go into a 40 seater. So comparing that with something like 1.5 to 2.5 euros per 100 kilometers per passenger in a turboprop, that is not far away, but it's still more expensive. So to summarize my work, I think the hydrogen fuel cell propulsion for passenger airplanes is feasible for a 40 seater from today's perspective, even bigger airplanes, maybe up to like 140, but that would be passengers, but that would be a vision, I would say. And from today's perspective, with a storage system, which we know today, which can be certified, we can reach 2000 kilometers of range. We can reach higher range with other um, systems on ground. But from our perspective, there is a lot of work, work which can, has to be done to get them certified. So on a megawatt scale technology, uh, we have to work. So definitely we have to change from hundreds of kilowatt to megawatts and a lot of megawatts. And then we will get a lot of CO2 reduction pot potential. But we have to take care about the balance of plant customization. So there definitely the focus has to be on for the next three to five years. And then the integration, taking care about the thermal management and the voltage management are crucial to go into the homologation. With this, thank you very much for your attention. There was a lot of uh, support from European and German funding schemes, um, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of uh, Economics, and also from the, the European Commission directly. And thank you very much for all the partners. Um, I have to mention my, my colleagues from the DLR, my colleagues from the university, from the h to fly my colleagues from Deal Aerospace and also from Pipistrel and from the airport of Stuttgart, which we worked together to achieve a part of this results. Thank you. Thank you, Josef. And like always, it's very interesting stuff and I would like to hear more. But uh, then we would sit here all day and you also don't have so much time. Thank you again. And uh, perhaps you can remind it again, you said you will have some announcement uh, doing later, I think even later this week, so that the people perhaps may join or where they can, when they can expect it. Yeah, so we will have a presentation of the sixth generation of the hydrogen fuel cell HY4. And this would be on Friday um, this week at uh, 1.30. 
and I will send you, Willy, um, a central link so everyone can then check in on that link on the h2fly.de page. Super. De definitely great. And uh, we continue. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, hope next year we see us again in real China with a real trip. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, and uh, not only virtual. Our next presenter is uh, Philip Scheffel, CEO of the company APUS. APUS is doing different electric aircraft and also working on hydrogen aircraft. So Philip, uh, I think you should be among the audience. We got, at mm -hmm. least I've seen you before. So if you uh, put, yeah, I see you. Ah, perfect. Very okay. good. <laughs> and uh, I think you will share your screen. Yes. Uh, the microphone is a little bit low noise, so perhaps if you go a little bit closer, it's better to understand. Okay, can you hear me? Now it's good. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, and you can. Green is coming, and I go off. Talk to you later. Okay, um, I just arrived in the uh, convention and had the pleasure to listen to the last part of. Josef Kahlo, um, whom we know uh, very well. Um, he is really uh, the pioneer in this, uh, in this field of uh, uh, hydrogen technology. And uh, we appreciate uh, very much to uh, have from time to time some uh, consultants with him. Um, he's, uh, of course, the, uh, the one who is doing the, the basic research. Um, and um, uh, delivers the basics uh, we build on. Uh, so uh, what is APUS? APUS is um, an engineering design um, office um, uh, close to Berlin in Germany and uh, uh, in the east of Berlin. And uh, we are actually uh, designing uh, aircraft systems. Um, it can be uh, a structure, it can be full-scale aircraft, um, everything that is needed um, by OEMs. So uh, normally we are working for um, other aircraft manufacturers. Um, and this is uh, from the sport aircraft until um, the drone or uh, multi-seat aircraft, uh, everything. Um, we have, uh, we are uh, EASA part 21J um, approved. So uh, we have some privileges until uh, performing flight tests by ourselves, and uh, that's what we are doing also in the past. Uh, additionally, we have uh, we are 9,100 uh, certified, and uh, we are short before Part 21G uh, certification. That doesn't mean that we want to be an aircraft manufacturer in the future, but um, to qualify our prototyping, uh, um, we need that. So that's uh, for APUS. And uh, next to a lot of programs uh, we do with our customers, uh, we have an own project running since um, almost five years on the basic research. And that's uh, also related hydrogen propulsion systems. And uh, that's, I think, the reason why uh, we were invited here. And uh, that is how the program looks like. Um, in our uh, engineering life, we see a lot of different technologies and we are able to compare them quite well. And um, in, this, um, in this surrounding, we found that the hydrogen propulsion system definitely has a, uh, a future nowadays uh, compared to uh, battery electric aircrafts um, when it comes to range. And um, there's no other technology at the moment that can compete when we talk about emission-free flying. I think this is uh, also clear for many of them, uh, of us in the, in the meanwhile. And um, yeah, of course, there are big challenges. Um, uh, most challenges are around the fuel cell itself, um, where uh, Josef Kahlo is uh, working on, but the other a big challenge is how to store uh, the hydrogen in the aircraft as it is a very light um, gas um, that needs to be compressed or cooled down. 
in small aircrafts, um, we have a problem to cool it down um, because we need uh, um, a lot of insulation, isolation of the tanks and we don't have the volume uh, for that. So uh, that's why we decide here uh, for compressed um, hydrogen. And uh, of course, we want to keep the uh, fuselage free. So our uh, solution is to store the hydrogen in the wings. So, um, and um, to do so, uh, we need a certain volume in the wing. And uh, that means a totally new aerodynamic uh, concept uh, for this. You need uh, an airfoil that can contain as much as possible volume, uh, but is still capable to cruise fast. And um, there we did uh, basic research in, uh, in the last years. And I think we found an optimum for such a twin en engine aircraft. Um, to, to store the hydrogen. Um, the aircraft itself will, uh, will compete in the, uh, in the class of, um, in the lower four seat class aircraft. Um, so uh, let's say a Cirrus SR20 uh, can be a, a competition. Um, and uh, what you see here, um, the weight, uh, the total weight will be higher than uh, the competitive aircraft uh, due to the higher structural mass of the hydrogen. Um, there will be a six seat uh, variant of it. Uh, so uh, once the um, power density of um, hydrogen fuel cells goes up, um, we can, uh, so we need a little bit more takeoff in this case. Uh, we can also, the fuselage is big enough to contain six people. Um, just to give you an Im imagination how it looks like in comparison, uh, here's the DA uh, Diamond DA62, uh, the comparison, so the size is uh, more or less like that. And uh, yeah, the DA62 has seven seats nowadays, so six plus one uh, small seat. The system itself is um, fully redundant. Uh, that's something we need to do nowadays um, to get the first step into the door of certification um, because um, we have a very, quite complex technology around the, um, the electronics and also the hydrogen systems. And um, we want to use all the uh, redundancy uh, benefits that we can get from the uh, from the twin engine. So we have uh, two electric engines, two fuel cells, and also by the uh, emergency hydrogen fuel tanks, we are fully redundant uh, in the systems. Um, there will be uh, some means um, for the hydrogen system. Um, there will be a high pressure system, a middle pressure system, low pressure system. Um, all controlled by a uh, hydrogen and energy management uh, system. And yeah, some, some details uh, we can, uh, we will discuss in, in later stages. But what you can see here, the general concept, we will have a rectangular uh, inner wing um, to be able to produce cylindrical tubes at that length. Uh, we, uh, the inner wing is, uh, um, nine meter 20 long. Um, that is more or less uh, triggered by the size of, out, uh, of available autoclaves um, because the inner wing is uh, produced in uh, high temperature pre-prec uh, materials. So um, everything is uh, on the inner wing is uh, high temperature carbon pre-prec. Yeah, that is uh, the outer wings are um, um, then aerodynamically uh, necessary to give uh, at least a little bit ellipt elliptical uh, uh, lift distribution. Um, but that's also some penalty uh, we we get uh, the relatively uh, big wing, and uh, that results in uh, comparable a uh, little bit lower uh, cruising speeds uh, than competitive uh, aircrafts have nowadays. Of course, a big topic is the energy management itself. Um, also here, we have a uh, long time research um, on mathematical algorithms. This is only an example now for the PowerPoint slide. Uh, it will look definitely 
uh, different, um, but uh, here we are working uh, with universities and ourselves, um, a small team on, uh, on the system, how to distribute the energies, how to track um, the lifetime of batteries and so on. Um, this definitely needs to be done. And yeah, it controls the energy flow. Um, what you can see here, we will have um, all the electronics, uh, basic electronics in the uh, nacelles themselves. So we have the electric motors, the controllers and the batteries to compensate the hysteresis of the um, fuel cell directly in, in one nacelle. Uh, so, uh, and the hydrogen fuel uh, pipes goes there from the, uh, from the wing and from the, uh, from the front. Yeah. Okay, um, here again, the concept of the hydrogen storage. Uh, I think this is essential to make um, um, hydrogen available in the lower weight classes of aircraft. Um, we see a break even of uh, energy density somehow around um, two kilowatt hours per kilogram. That's uh, something we have to achieve. Uh, with high pressure systems in cars nowadays, we reach around 1.6 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And um, this is, it cannot be increased uh, very much anymore because um, there's a, the, the, um, the fibers are loaded by, uh, by tension and there's a limit of the carbon fibers and this cannot be increased anymore. So uh, how you can uh, increase the power uh, the energy density is by uh, structural uh, synergy. And um, our concept is exactly that. Um, and when we use the tubes as the uh, bending beam in, inside the wing, uh, we can reduce uh, the weight of the tanks by the virtual spar. So um, the tank itself will be lighter. And um, yeah, this is how such a wing looks like when it's built. And uh, the biggest challenge, uh, to be honest here, is uh, the manufacturing process. Um, how to build such long uh, tubes, how to uh, make the end, uh, end of the tubes, the pole caps um, strong enough, um, and uh, how to um, make it safe enough uh, from the structural point of view. Yeah, um, the safety concept um, for the uh, fuel cell itself, of course, we have uh, designated fire zones on, uh, on many places. It's always the biggest problem uh, in hybrid electric propulsion systems. You have the propulsion system distributed all over the um, airplane. You have pipes um, and uh, fire by, uh, it, it can cause fire. And um, our concept is Um, yeah, there was an echo now, but over uh, to to separate um, uh, the fire zones so that even a fuel cell or components here, converters are here too, uh, can burn without affecting uh, the other side. That are the aerodynamic and the weight uh, data. So uh, we have a span of around uh, 12.6 meters. Um, and uh, the wing with 18 square meters uh, slightly bigger uh, than comparable aircraft uh, due to the, the higher maximum takeoff weight. For the four-seater, 1.8 tons. For the six-seater, almost two tons. We want to stay uh, below two tons uh, intentionally. Definitely the uh, hydrogen systems will work on heavier aircrafts too, but as we are uh, here at the stage where we first time want to achieve a full certification. Um, we want to uh, keep the budget as low as possible um, um, by, the, uh, by the maximum takeoff weight. Is it me the reason for the issue or it's from somebody else? No. Okay. 
that's uh, the time uh, schedule for the moment. So we are working on the program, at least on the basic research since uh, 2015. Um, since beginning of um, um, 2019, we are uh, concepting um, the aircraft. This is done more or less. We are uh, in the detailed design uh, phase nowadays. Um, we are also developing uh, the fuel cell system and the propulsion system nowadays. This is um, on the electric side also running since a while. And of course, this is not um, our experience, not only come from this program, but we are working since uh, some years on different um, electric propulsion aircrafts. Um, for example, on the extra 330, uh, at that time it was Siemens aircraft. Um, um, we work on this aircraft still uh, to make the retrofit with electric propulsion system. We are working for Zafon, working for Rolls Royce. Um, um, some of you know the Apus i5 program, a hybrid electric um, propulsion system. Um, and we are developing and integrating the, um, the system, the propulsion system, and uh, some smaller um, aircraft uh, manufacturers we are working for. Yeah, uh, in the competition, uh, I said it already a little bit earlier. Um, this seems at the moment, at the first view, a little bit disappointing why we are not competing directly with an DA62 or Cirrus SR22. Um, yeah, because it's simply not possible at the moment. Uh, the power densities of the systems are still too low. Uh, the basic um, weight of the propulsion systems are too high and uh, the penalty we pay is the, uh, the cruising speed and the range. Nevertheless, uh, um, I think a cruising aircraft makes sense uh, from a range on, of, uh, of 800 kilometers, something around that. Um, the battery electric propulsion systems are far uh, below. Um, we are at least uh, at 1,000 kilometers, that is uh, quite good, I think, for an uh, electric propulsion system. Also, the cruising speeds are competitive. And um, the big advantage uh, that we have with um, hydrogen propulsion is um, the high payload, because we don't have to reduce uh, the payload by heavy fuel. Um, it is uh, when we... Uh, Tank when the tank is full for around uh, four or five hours, we uh, refuel it with 25 kilogram of hydrogen. So this is only uh, reduced by 25 kilogram, so 450 kilogram payload for a four seater. This is uh, uh, quite comfortable. There will be uh, different uh, products, of course, um, at the end. Uh, this is uh, just a first idea um, how we can uh, have the road to market. So um, just some mentioned prices, we will be, um, the systems are quite expensive, of course. So um, at the very beginning, um, it is not really a competition um, to the um, conventional aircraft, but uh, definitely the systems will be cheaper in the future. This is also our big hope on the, on the fuel cell as it becomes a mass product. Uh, the price will go down, uh, but the first aircrafts will definitely have prices like that. That are our partners nowadays um, in, in uh, all the programs that are running. Uh, of course, it's uh, supported by the German government, by regional governments, uh, fundings, um, and the rest is uh, completely financed by ourselves. And um, yeah, we are using uh, fuel cells at the moment, uh, a stack uh, from PowerCell um, at the moment. Yeah, it, we will see what are the better systems in the future. Uh, Fraunhofer Reus Reus for the electrical propulsion system. And on the structural side, we are working close together with, uh, with our supplier Cortesa. Um, that, uh, we have a long time strategic partnership with them uh, already. Yeah, this should be uh, the short presentation of our product. Um, I hope it's uh, exciting for you. We are always looking for, uh, for partners, uh, for potential 
uh, investors, uh, definitely. So um, just uh, come in contact with us. And um, of course, um, any comments, uh, any feedback uh, from the market, from potential customers is welcome. And uh, yeah, we'd be happy if um, some people contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, and uh, very interesting project. So when we were thinking about like uh, um, use cases of hydrogen, uh, actually we didn't really think of some something which can come to the market and it looks like an aircraft which you can buy and you can fly. So we are definitely, it's an amazing uh, project you have there. And I now, before we go to any uh, further questions, I will hand over to our last speakers of the session and the day. And then we can have, uh, I would say, a normal Q&A session as not everybody could join the rooms. And then we can have the Zoom, uh, the ro Zoom rooms again, uh, where we could talk uh, more privately with the presenters. Um, so thank you very much, Philip. And our next presenter is Klaus Ullmann. Klaus? If you unmute your camera and your microphone, we've seen you before, but now I don't. Ah, now I see you. Yeah, the, uh, the microphone is unmuted, but your camera is still. Ah, here we are. Hello, Klaus. Yeah, in Corona, yet it didn't see so often like normally like Aero and others. So Klaus is coming. Uh, we had today we had very different uh, approaches to electric aviation. We had industry, we had, uh, we had the academics, we had the authorities. Klaus is a pilot. In first line, I would say he's a pilot. He's also doing, uh, is a researcher, but he's a pilot with a lot, a whole bunch of world records. Uh, so Klaus, tell us what you plan with a hydrogen plan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to China and our internet audience. I'm a glider pilot. My motor is based on the principle of gravitation, and my energy source is a very powerful fusion reactor, our sun. Flying in a glider is a little bit like a dream. You transfer constantly altitude and speed, the lost height you will regain in thermals or dynamic lifts. That allows us to fly unbelievable distances of hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. There's just this small amount of fossil energy we need for a winch launch, an aerotow, or a self-launch. 
necessary to climb to the initial altitude before starting the soaring performance. This little dirt under the fingernail was always a thorn in my side, disturbing the perfect image of a zero emission flight that you can do with gliding. But how to do better? Ten years ago, I could participate as a test pilot in the Egenius project. This was a fully electric prototype which was built from the scratch by engineers and students from the Institute for Aircraft Design of the University of Stuttgart. They finished in less than two years a battery-driven electric plane which is still, until today, the best electric aircraft of the world. With this plane I could fly six world records in distance, speed and altitude. They are still valid until today. Two years later we flew a spectacular crossing of the Alps from Stuttgart, Germany to Italy and back nearly 700 kilometers in one day. Energy costs around about 21 euros. Lightweight materials like carbon fiber composites and the big advantage of an electric motor in aviation with its fantastic power and volume to weight ratio allows much more freedom in aircraft design than ever before. The modern electric engine has around about four times more power in much less volume compared with our usual combustion engines. Better efficiency of airframes and propeller can easily cut the consumption to nearly a half compared to conventional aircrafts. Energy storing in nowadays batteries is highly efficient. That sounds perfect. But are there not any drawbacks? Unfortunately, there are. First, batteries are heavy and have a low specific energy. One kilogram of kerosene has 50 times more energy content than one kilogram of a modern lithium battery. The price of batteries is still quite high, even if it is decreasing. The time to charge batteries need at least three to four hours. Range is one of the biggest problems, problems of air taxis today. For longer flight, you need a range extender, which could be a small combustion engine as a generator to charge a smaller battery pack and replace the gain of weight with fuel. All calculations show a significant redu reduction of fuel consumption. But what about zero emission? The zero emission solutions are fuel cells powered by green hydrogen. There is no doubt. Hydrogen makes only sense if it's produced with renewable energy. Local electrolyzers can do the job via solar panels on hangar roofs. This is what we are working on. Electric propulsion and fuel cells are the perfect tools for a real sustainable aviation. Very low noise and no vibration. Once you have flown in such a plane, enjoying the comfort of such a silent flight, you will find it difficult to go back to these fuel-to-noise converters 
we are flying today. HiFly is a great team and I am proud to be part of it. Karl Käse, one of the project managers of eGenius and now owner of Casaere Engineers Bureau, is responsible for integration and certification of ultralights, air taxis and planes. Peter Stadthalder, owner of PS Hightech, is a specialist for light, extreme light hydrogen tanks, fuel cells and hydrogen infrastructure. And last not least, my glider will serve as a test bed for this disruptive clean technology. And here I start to dream. I'm convinced that only technical knowledge and progress will solve a lot of climate problems we have today. An emission-free flight from Germany to the Himalayas, soaring above the top of the world, creating beautiful pictures of a wonderful glider in stunning landscapes, changing fear for our climate in fascination and hope. Let me finish with Franz Kafka. Paths are made by walking. Thank you for your attention. Now I understand why you wanted to play the video. <laughs> I think you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, so Klaus, you're still muted. Now it's better. Now it's better. Much better. Okay. Oh, sorry for this. Uh, I had some problems to see the video. I hope uh, in other uh, parts of uh, the countries it was a better internet. Uh, yeah. And you could see the video and the mu hear the music. Uh, so my part is the emotional part. So I'm a pilot and a very emotional. And I'm absolutely fascinated by the possibility of green flights. Uh, and I hope really that in the near future, uh, we can do such beautiful things uh, flying around the world, flying in high mountains uh, with the help of emission-free technology. Thank you very much. I think I go back onto the stage again. And I would ask also the other first, the other two persons, um, uh, because we, the, we are finished with our presentations for today. Uh, and I think this was a perfect closure of, you know, uh, starting with the paperwork in the very first session and having the dream of flying in the last one. It really is a nice progress. And after several hours, I think this was perfect. Um, so perhaps uh, Philip and uh, I think Joseph is still available a little bit. I'm not sure because he had a time limit. So maybe he would have to leave already. But Philip, if you could come back on again and then we could have some uh, questions and answers, please. Philip uh, seems to be. I have to look for him. This is a little bit difficult. Mm -mm -mm. Then uh, uh, what I would say is then we... Uh, 
Scheffel. Uh, Philip Scheffel, is he still? Let's have a look. No, it does seem that he is not anymore into the presentation. I think he also said, um, yeah, probably he has some other appointments which he couldn't shift. I think I remember something like this, so it's my mistake. So, okay, then I would say perhaps we could have, uh, like, I see Florian Hilpert is still in the call. Uh, uh, have those people who are, uh, who have been presenters and who are still there, if they could come uh, switch their video on, on and come back on, because then we could start with questions and answers. I have several, but um, um, so I don't see. It will, we'll see if some people come in addition. That's good. If somebody of you has questions, just ask them. There have been questions before. I'm just scrolling through the chat before. Uh, um, uh, this was just remarks. Uh, if in the, um, the one, the question would be um, uh, if the distributed electric pro adopts air cooling uh, and no uh, air entries, the controllers components, how to guarantee uh, the life under the maximum continuous power? Um, and I, I know, I see there was the answer here already. Thermal management on the. Yes, but I can. Yes, I can comment. Okay, uh, yeah, if no. You want to. Um, yeah, the um, thermal challenge for power electronics is really, yeah, it's really a big challenge. Um, power electronics are, yeah, I said it before, are sometimes seen as um, yeah, standard electric components, but they are not. They are highly mechatronic integrated uh, systems. And in the breakout room, I have uh, told about this, um, about half our engineering stuff is uh, mechanical engineers working on power electronics. Mm -hmm. So we have no power electronic project where we have um, an engi a mechanical engineer missing. Uh, even the head of our inverter development um, department at IASP is a mechanical uh, engineer. Um, because uh, with these new silicon carbide and gallium nitride, the white band cap fast switching devices, with these new devices, the mechanical design of your power electronic system has more impact on the electrical behavior than the electrical design, actually. This is really counterintuitive, but the, yeah, how do you explain uh, best way? The parasitic um, components inside your uh, electric systems they get so dominant and they are defined by the mechanical design of your system that it's really more a mechanical challenge to build a large integrated power electronic system than an electrical uh, challenge. It remains a large electrical challenge regarding failure handling, of course. Uh, if you have like multi-phase failure redundant approaches, this is electrical design. But the really the efficiency is the mechanical problem. And with the efficiency, we come back to the thermal uh, topic. What was the question referred to? Uh, you really have to simulate your entire power electronics uh, systems from the envir uh, environment down to the device itself. And it's especially um, tricky for um, air cooling because with water cooling, it's easy. You have a defined um, uh, flow of the water. You have a defined uh, temperature mostly. But with air cooling, you typically have to consider all the transient um, situations that can occur. And therefore, it's really necessary to build a complete digital twin of your power electronic system and then simulate from the environmental cooling situation down to the device itself. So the um, system level engineering for the thermal design is crucial here to have air cooling for high power silicon carbide power electronics. Okay, thank you answer, for the it's really extensive a topic. Uh, answer. And I would say now those people uh, who want to ask a question, if you switch on your screen and then you, you can ask the question yourself. Because just if you want to ask a question, you switch on your screen as uh, first uh, image and then you talk. And this gets us a little bit more uh, interactivity. I have a question here from uh, Olaf who was asking before. Uh, Olaf Otto, um, how you can work with uh, Rolls Royce? In, uh, ah, it was a question for Rolls, yeah. for Olaf. How you can work with Rolls Royce in an e uh, airplane project? Um, are 
a Rolls Royce motor for sale or just uh, uh, for the, for projects now? And uh, so Olaf, if you're still in the call, um, would be great if you can join. Um, otherwise, uh, the question does not let me search. Ola. Olaf Otto, he is still in. Um, Olaf, I'll ask him. Uh, uh, I ask him to unmute himself, but he is at the moment not. Probably he has some other conversation at this point. Ah, uh, sorry, I have to write him in a chat. So maybe we have the question, uh, the answer for this question later. Um, but I know that they are ramping up for uh, the products for sale because in his presentation he is selling that they are uh, have the product now and they do pricing for the product and they say research was one part but now we have to make it uh, the, the research to a product. Uh, I see you Peter, do you want to ask a question? Okay, then I would say I unmute so i think you can unmute now yourself yeah now you are okay how it thank you very much uh question to florian hi florian my name is peter stadthalter yes i think not i'm not uh, located not far away from the airline it's uh, uh, it's uh, the question is no, are no, these yeah. uh, power electronics uh, uh, systems are they already available um, can they be purchased yeah, yeah. or what is the actual state so our power electronics systems uh, they are typically research prototypes because we are a research organization uh, Fraunhofer is one of the largest research organizations uh, in Germany with a lot of institutes um, so our power electronics typically they go um, they stop in the development before um, the uh, manufacturing for end customers um, so we do the development all to the way where um, one of our customers can then proceed in uh, the series production but with the series production we are not involved um, the background is Fraunhofer has um, some percentage of its revenue as base funding from the German government and uh, this is uh, why we are not allowed to compete with engineering suppliers that can go and sell like for example power electronics so we are only uh, able to sell um, let's say power electronic prototypes for test bench applications but we can um, go to, through a series development together where we supply with engineering support throughout the series development process but our customers are the ones that really produce the power electronics and sell them in the end Okay, is there one certain uh, producer of the power electronics in this moment? Um, actually, we are working with, um, let's say, all um, all companies uh, in uh, Germany that are dealing with uh, power electronics. Um, for example, if you go to the um, to the automotive uh, sector, uh, we are delivering typically the prototypes for their very first um, test fleets where they need like 20 power electronics um, for a certain vehicle um, because the large manufacturers of course they won't build a dedicated power electronic for a new uh, vehicle in number one or 20 this is the niche that where we really supply the systems and typically they then take our prototypes to a manufacturer show them the prototype and say we want something like this and typically these manufacturers then come back to us and ask us, okay, how did you do this? And then we try to figure out a way to adopt it to their manufacturing processes. Um, so this is typically the way how they go into the market. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I have a question to those uh, from, uh, from the, those people which are in the fuel cell area um, or in the hydrogen area um, what do you think about this uh, project presented uh, this liquid uh, uh, LHCA the uh, um, the uh, liquid storing of uh, of uh, fuel cell uh, of, of hydrogen in oil 
because this is, is for me it really seems to be something I heard about this some time ago but do you think that this is something which is really could be on the market fairly soon because you're, you're, you're working with hydrogen so you must have had thought about this uh, Florian I, I was just uh, uh, just yes, asking so, you yeah, um, hmm. yeah. the um, uh, the yeah, other storage the of hydrogen, hydrogen is really um, uh, yeah, yeah, one of the um, key problems uh, to solve, especially um, the supply on site and how to fill up um, systems with hydrogen. Um, I personally am not involved in this. Um, as I said before, we are around 70 Fraunhofer Institutes, each institute dedicated um, to certain topics. Um, but where I am involved a little bit is in the what we have heard before from Hydrogenius, the LOHC uh, technology. Uh, it, it's close to what you're mentioning now, so storing um, hydrogen in a liquid carrier. Um, and the LOHC was presented excellent by a hydrogenius, uh, actually, also with all the challenges um, that lie behind, especially also regarding power density. At the moment, I also think that it's um, uh, very useful for stationary um, application where you can store it on site, then uh, extract it uh, on site and fill it in maybe a pressurized uh, or liquefied, um, let's say, vehicle. Um, but for um, let's say mobile applications themselves, like aircrafts or or, or, or cars or so on, uh, the power density is at the moment really yeah it needs needs to be addressed more. No, uh, the, the the question would be only I think as I understand there right, it would be more for the storage at the at the airport and or yes. for the storage at some other fields um, because uh, as i understand also he mentioned that if you, if you have the liquid and you want to get the uh, liquid uh, the the hydrogen out of the wall uh, out of the liquid again you have to have energy uh, and it uh, and this is a process that probably you don't want to have on board of an aircraft but it will because it will be complex and heavy but just for storing outside i think it uh, may be interesting um, absolutely and if you could integrate it in an overall thermal um, management for a large facility where you have for example you have waste heat from some cooling infrastructure um, that you can then utilize um, for the LOHC process this is really uh, would have a great great impact mm. okay um, at this point I would have one question to Klaus Ullmann because uh, you've, we've seen at the end of the film that you say you start dreaming. Are there any concrete projects which you're planning, uh, what you want to do and where we can expect to see in the news at some point that somebody has flown a racket with a hydrogen aircraft? You're muted. You're, you're still... Uh, Klaus, you're still muted. Uh, Aufhebung der Stummschaltung. Oh, so now you hear me. Now, now we hear you, yeah. And now, not again. <laughs> Klaus, you're somehow muted again. Yeah, Klaus, you're... Again, I think it was my mistake. I was yes. not patient enough. Like my son, when he presses a button on the computer, he always hits it ten times, and then it's on, off, on, off. Uh, it's yours, Klaus. Yeah. So uh, my part is to emotionalize uh, this, uh, all these technologies uh, with beautiful pictures, uh, with uh, things to do. Uh, and I'm. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, the passion. Uh, I have uh, not a, too much passion to waste for all these new technologies. So uh, I would like my STEMI as a best test bed because it's a, a really very nice plane to do that. Uh, you can make an electric motor in front, uh, you have an, uh, a lot of space behind uh, in this tubular structure, the stemmer. Uh, and uh, so uh, I hope uh, to fly, let's say, in six months uh, with an electric plane, actually, and then I would like to use it as a, yes, uh, a test bed with uh, probably a combustion engine 
at first uh, as a range extender, uh, because uh, as I mentioned in the in the uh, the conference, uh, we need we need more energy than the batteries uh, can give us nowadays. So when you are, want to fly more than 1,000 kilometers, that's from my opinion the minimum that you need to fly around the world. So I'm, I'm thinking always big. Uh, so what I would like to do is to start with world records. Uh, anyway, there are a lot of world records to break. That I started with the Eugenius from the University of Stuttgart. Uh, probably I will uh, fly another project uh, with an Antares, an electric glider, which uh, has another system uh, to make bigger ranges. But still, they are limited up to 400 kilometers. And uh, at the end, that's what I see is, uh, anyway, the hydrogen, because uh, the full circle that you can make uh, is without any uh, emission uh, when we use renewable energies. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of discussion about climate and so on. And I call it always the baseball uh, uh, players, because we work with fear nowadays. That's what I mentioned. I would like to work with hope, with beautiful pictures, to motivate people to change that. Because we heard about, from Joseph, we heard that uh, the, the, the costs of these technologies are quite higher, still quite higher. But, uh, you know, when you are in the desert and you have nothing to drink, you would pay $10,000 for one bottle of water. Uh, and uh, when we are looking for our climate, I would like to motivate people to change that, to pay much more money. Nowadays we use uh, bio foods and so on. And that is my idea behind. And I'm happy to work with engineers like uh, Karl Kesa uh, from HiFi, who is uh, responsible for the certification stuff and technology, uh, technological stuff, and Peter Stadthalder. Uh, who is uh, the man uh, from the uh, fuel cells and infrastructure as well because all these things have to be together and my part is to emotionalize to convince politics technicians and not uh, the, the, the citizen to, to apply for this uh, new technology uh, yeah, thank you very much. I just had to check if I muted. No, um, I think uh, what we may do now is we uh, either have another breakout session, um, and I think there is an option here where you can uh, raise hands and, and vote, uh, or if we continue with an open Q and A session. So please uh, give me your. I yeah, think perhaps a question. Ah, Olaf. Uh, Olaf is back. That's great. Then we can answer the question which we had before. Uh, it is how can uh, the question was how can uh, uh, we work? Can I work with Rolls Royce in an e airplane project? Are Rolls Royce mo motors now for sale, or are there prototypes only? So um, the, the the propulsion systems that we have, they are they are prototypes. Um, we are working together with partners in uh, in projects. Um, it's by nature, quite limited because we want to focus on um, a small number of partners who are working on bringing their products to certification. So something that was um, um, shown in the press fairly recently, for example, is our collaboration with the company Technam. Um, in the commuter class, it's quite it's, it's, it's quite limited. Um, in terms of in terms of um, having the equipment we use in projects, um, the easiest way is just to get in touch with us and, and to discuss it. Um, as I said, that, um, the number of projects that we're going to run in parallel is going to be quite small over the next few years. Um, we 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 sort of come from a um, from a past of doing sort of. 10, 20 projects at the same time. We're, we're consciously now slimming this down um, as we're focusing on product certification for um, our products. So um, get in touch, um, let's have a discussion, and even if we can't support you um, right now, maybe then we can support in the future. Okay, thank you for the detailed answer. Uh, we will have a little short section with uh, breakout rooms later, but I saw I was a bit 
uh, scrolling through our audience and I saw uh, several uh, very interesting people there which we had as presenters in the in the recent years so I would definitely try to ask Carl Kather uh, a question if he's still in the call because he was mentioned by Klaus before and I know that he is working on several electric projects and he will or there will be some of the projects also presented tomorrow so uh, let's see if yeah yeah here he is, uh, Carl. You now, if you unmute, we are nearly perfect. Uh, and I, I think I have to find you probably, and I have first to give you the permission because we uh, unfollowing aufhören der Anfordern. Yeah, so that's fine. Fine now. Yeah, so um, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, so now it works. So yeah, so, so mm -hmm. I know that you work on several projects. I know that several are under NDA, but we had, for example, last year presenting, uh, you was presenting that you're working on the aviation commuter project. Then we have, I think tomorrow, uh, some of your team is also are presenting something else. So perhaps give us an overview, which is also a teaser for our guests to uh, stay in uh, and to tune uh, to join in for tomorrow again by the way the connection link for tomorrow is exactly the same so when we finish here tomorrow you click the same button and you're back in mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah uh, thank, thank you very much, much. Um, yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's a little bit short term for me uh, I have to scratch my head and think what I can talk about or what I cannot talk about. Uh, I mean, we are now on the, how shall I say, we are now on the way from experimental electric aircraft to certification of electric aircraft. Um, uh, electric aircraft or even hydrogen aircraft, what Close has presented is the goal that we are working on with him uh, to make a hydrogen aircraft uh, reality and have it certified um, yeah, and our main focus in at the moment and in the next years is to make uh, air certified aircrafts commercially available um, here in Germany we have the best um, uh, conditions for this purpose uh, around the world, I believe, because with the new German ultralight aircraft uh, airworthiness specification, the LTFUL 2020, uh, German ultralights are equivalent to light sport aircraft uh, from uh, definition, uh, United States light sport aircraft would be equivalent to a German ultralight aircraft uh, and this new airworthiness specification uh, released sometime in spring this year is the first airworthiness uh, specification in the world according to my knowledge uh, that includes that includes requirements for electric aircraft for electric propulsion unit this is important and uh, this means here in Germany we can certify an electric aircraft without uh, work around uh, with special conditions or equivalent safety or whatever we just can straightforward certify at least at the moment two-seat light sport aircraft um, quest, uh, uh, follow up question on this one uh, and uh, mm -hmm. by the way like uh, I said before if anybody of you has a question uh, to uh, anybody who has been on the screen or who is still on the screen uh, just switch your screen on then we see it and you can ask the question but follow up question so um, actually two one is isn't there an issue that in this ultralight regulation the empty weight is a little bit uh, challenge to uh, de defined in this new for the electric aircraft so that it will be quite difficult to have an electric aircraft which flies a long time due to the battery weight mm, yes I mean this is a challenge I, I fully agree um, 
if you look, for example, uh, however, I mean, if you look at, uh, for example, PP stress now EASA certified aircraft, uh, the wheel is electro. Uh, it's in the same weight category. It has also a takeoff weight of 600 kilogram, but it is, uh, uh, yeah. So we, we let's say with this ultralight slash light sport aircraft, we play in the same category, in the same weight category. Um, yeah, it's clear. So. Uh, the, the weight, weight, the weight problem, problem is an issue. issue. We, we have, have to uh, address this from several aspects. Uh, first thing is, of course, a uh, reduction of uh, the structural weight of the aircraft, improving the design. Uh, the second point is uh, to improve the aerodynamic efficiency. Um, when you look, for example, at the Egenius aircraft, you can, and there are now enough publications uh, on this aircraft already, you can see that increasing the efficiency uh, is a big key uh, of improving electric aircraft design. Um, yeah, it's very simple. Uh, you need less energy, uh, you, uh, you need less power to fly, you need less energy which you have to carry with you. So, um, yeah, and the, and the, fir the third thing of, the, of what we, how we can address this weight limit is, of course, um, this approach to uh, develop a lightweight fuel cell system with a higher energy density. Okay, thank you for mm -hmm. the answer. I also see, because if you look at our schedule, we are nearly over time already, although... We and if so, for those people who don't want to participate in this, we start tomorrow at 9 o'clock, European, Central European time again. Um, and so, if you liked it, tell your friends. If don't, don't tell them. Uh, and uh, I would like you uh, to have you back tomorrow. We have interesting some things to come up. Something, for example, Olaf mentioned very shortly in his presentation, the new commuter aircraft from Technam with Rolls-Royce propulsion system will for the first time be presented on a stage like this with international audience and we will also have several others uh, look at the schedule and we even have some more than it in the schedule so talk to you uh, soon and now I go to the break session and we'll see uh, how this works this time and tomorrow I hope to see most of you again. Thank you. Bye. How can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com Then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, eVTOLs and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.